Parents, imagine taking your teenager to the hospital with a cough and a fever. This is Matthew. He went to the hospital thinking he had the flu or even COVID. His condition quickly got worse and he ended up on life support. Turns out he had swelling around his heart. It's called myocarditis. The way doctors caught it is what's groundbreaking. See, Matthew's family enrolled him in a study at Stanford Medicine. Researchers were using rapid DNA sequencing to crack medical mysteries. And within hours, they'd figured it out. Three weeks later, Matthew had a new heart and is said to be doing well. Now, the technique behind this is incredibly fast, so fast that now Stanford holds the Guinness World Record for the fastest DNA sequencing technique, five hours and two minutes. The previous record was 14 hours. So scientists can sequence your entire genetic code faster than you can fly from New York to LA. But how does this technology work? And how soon might it be in the hands of your doctor? Joining us now is the senior author of that study, Dr. Ewan Ashley. He's a professor of genetics and an associate dean at the Stanford School of Medicine. Dr. Ashley, welcome. Thank you. Uh, great to be with you. When I saw this report, I was instantly fascinated. And as we were talking about this among our team, one of our producers thought about this moment in the year 2000 when President Bill Clinton announced the first map of the entire human genome. Watch. We are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. What's your sense, Dr. Ashley, of how far we've come in plotting more of the, the off-roads and highways and byways on that human map? Yeah, we've come really far. I mean, that project that was announced by President Clinton there was 10 years, $3 billion, 10 countries to sequence just one genome. And actually, it was even half of a genome. And in the, the last few years, we've moved on. By 2010, you could sequence a genome in about five days for about $50,000. But now we're in a position where you can sequence a human genome for about $1,000. And that by itself is groundbreaking. But being able to sequence a genome is one thing and solve medical mysteries. Being able to do it fast is another because some of our patients, especially little babies with uh, really critical conditions and the critical care units of our hospitals, they need answers faster than we can currently give them. And we can't wait around for weeks for an answer. We thought to ourselves, we'd like to see if we could do that in hours. Can you break down for us in layman's terms what the biggest challenge is to the speed of the sequencing of the genome? Is it I would imagine it's not computer power, right? Because you can just get a more powerful computer. The, the, the speed of computers available at Stanford is probably quite staggering. But is it unraveling the genome? Is it actually reading it, interpreting the data? What's the biggest challenge? Yeah, it's a few different parts. And actually, the computers are a part of it, too. You know, we looked at every single step along the way when, that, that is required when you're sequencing a genome to try to make a diagnosis. We looked at how fast could we move the blood from the patient to the lab. Someone had to run, literally, to do that. And we looked at how fast we could get the DNA out of the blood, how fast we could get it onto the sequencer. A really critical part was the sequencing machine itself. This particular machine from a company based in Oxford called Oxford Nanopore allows us to we basically produce the data for an entire genome in, in one to two hours. But then we have the issue of, of analyzing it. And although you're right, we have big computers at Stanford, we actually had to upgrade our pipes even at Stanford in order to get the data off the machine and into the compute as fast as we could. And then eventually, of course, we have to take that list of six billion data points in one genome, turn it into a list of four and a half million data points, which is the variations we each have from each other, and then finally into a short list of 20 or 30 variants in which is the smoking gun for any individual patient. And then even within that, there's a matter of being able to make diagnoses. According to the study, the diagnostic rate with this new rapid sequencing te technology was 42%. That feels way below the threshold before we're ready to kind of deploy it in larger settings or in you know hospital systems and so on. What's the next step in terms of allowing these data to lead to more useful diagnoses. Yeah, and I certainly agree we would love to see that number pushed higher, but to put that in perspective, often these conditions are ones that have been, diagnosed, have been undiagnosed from any other uh, technology possible. So in fact, many times patients are coming to the hospital critically ill or sometimes non-critically ill, and they've been going to doctor after doctor after doctor 
not finding answers. And one of the things that genomic medicine, the idea of applying the genome to, to medicine and the diagnosis of new conditions, is it's been able to solve conditions that, that were unsolved for years uh, with, with patients who've accumulated hundreds of thousands of dollars and stacks of paper worth of medical notes just trying to solve the condition. So the genome brings us answers where no other medical test could bring us answers. And what's new about the work we, we show today is that we can do that much faster than we used to. Instead of waiting three months for an answer, we can get the answer potentially before the end of the nursing shift in which you sent the, the DNA. A few more questions before I have to let you go. What are some of the next steps for this? Like how widespread do you see this technology potentially being applied more generally or more in very specialized settings like Stanford? Yeah, I think it'll start in specialized centers. Uh, the group in San Diego has done a great, great work in this domain, our own center. Uh, we, we hope to, to let this make this available to not just our patients at Stanford, but patients further afield. But clearly, we're not able to supply this kind of technology to the entire world. So we really want to try and help teach other groups and other labs around the world how to do it and be able to get these machines and get this technology. Our own computer code will be made available, uh, open source for others to use. And we're looking forward to really trying to, to teach others how to do it so that we can bring these kind of rapid diagnoses to much, many, many more patients. And before I let you go, I just got to wonder, just on a visceral personal level, what was your reaction the first time you saw how quickly this works? I mean, what did you think? What did you say when you saw how fast it is? Oh, it, it just was incredible. I mean, my jaw was on the floor. We, we had this huge team. We had partners from Google, from NVIDIA, from the University of California, Santa Cruz, a big team, clinicians, mathematicians, computer scientists. And every week they'd come and like shave more minutes off this and my jaw would be on the floor looking at these major uh, just achievements week on week. And then when we finally got to apply it to patients and we saw these little kids, little babies coming into the intensive care unit and being able to give them answers within 12, hours or even seven hours, 18, 18 minutes is, is the fastest diagnosis that we made. It really made a difference. And when, when we hear to those, those patients, we hear back from them what a difference it made in their lives and the ability to give them therapies that were directed to their underlying condition with a test that used to take 10 years and now can be done in less than 10 hours. That, that was really heartwarming. Really. Oh, last few seconds before I let you go, I, one more thing I almost forgot to ask. Genetic information is data. Who owns the data? Does it belong to Stanford? Does it belong to the patient? Where does that go before we go? We, yeah, we very firmly believe that the data belongs to the patient. And so we have actually offered the, the DNA genome data back to the patients. They're welcome to have it. Some of them have taken us up on that. Uh, some of them have not. Of course, medical privacy, very important. We take a lot of time uh, and energy to make sure that the data is held privately, but it, it should be owned by the patient. Dr. Ewan Ashley of the Stanford School of Medicine, really fascinating. I appreciate you explaining it to us. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.